We are gathered here on the 75th anniversary of the landing on Peleliu by the 1st Marine Division, which began what they were told would be a swift three or four day battle. This estimate was one of the worst made in the Pacific War. The battle ended up lasting 73 days and saw the 1st Division suffer some of the most appalling casualty rates of World War II. Chesty Puller's 1st Regiment suffered near 70% casualty rate in just the first six days and was finished as a fighting unit. The fight to capture the Japanese positions in the infamous Umerbrogel Mountain became notorious for being one of the most terrible operations of the entire war. The division as a whole was severely debilitated, losing over one third of its men and was only able to fight again in the Okinawa campaign in April 1945. Elements of the U.S. Army's Wildcat Division, 81st Division, had to be called in to relieve the shot up units of the 1st Division and themselves suffered over 3,000 casualties. We're gathered here today in humble remembrance and acknowledgement of the vast suffering and sacrifices which took place on this island's haunting battlefields. We pay our respects to the countless sacrifices, both known and unknown, which current generations may be unaware of. As we explore this island's battle sites, we will carry a heavy load of memory with us and pay homage to the horrendous loss and magnificent bravery which took place here. We also acknowledge the incredible fighting spirit of the Japanese who fought here and died here. They too performed valiantly in a cause they believed in. This defense of Peleliu ushered in a whole new strategy of defense, which would cost the Allied forces dearly in the months to come. Okay, this is the promontory, what you see right there, that big knobby rock, that's it right there. So this is what the beach looked like there. We're gonna be walking down right here, okay? That's one of the, what one of these uh, anti-tank guns could do to a landing craft, right there. Look at this guy right here. You can tell he's in uh, psychic trauma for what's going on there. And this guy's uh, busy shooting, returning fire at the, the enemy there. That's a great shot. And this is a very tragic shot. You can see the promontory right there. And uh, this guy's writing out the uh, information they need for this guy that's just been killed so they can ID him before they uh, put him in the ground. That's a crate of ammunition I dug up on the beach out here a couple years ago. So that's what's under the sand out here. So we'll get out on the beach and head up towards the point. So we're looking at the bunker on the point that took the lives of so many Marines and knocked out so many amphibious tractors on the morning of September 15th. The weapon is actually still in there, although it's buried under coral debris from a recent typhoon. But this uh, gun here was not touched by pre-invasion uh, bombardment. Uh, it was almost invisible, as you can see, because uh, it was oblique from the uh, frontal fire, and the Japanese had coral piled up around it. People don't really know how many LVTs it knocked out, but it knocked out quite a few. Eventually, there was a rifle grenade fired in there, bounced off the barrel of the weapon, and set off the munitions that were inside the bunker. Uh, the Japanese that were in there went pouring out the rear of the bunker on fire, and the Marines that were over on the planks there were able to kill them all. So this was one of the most uh, active and uh, bloody sites uh, on the whole invasion beach. 
And if the Japanese had been successful in holding this position and counterattacking down the beach this way, they could have rolled up the whole invasion. So looking at a very critical position here on uh, the morning of the invasion. You can actually see the treads of a Sherman tank that was knocked out right here in front of the bunker. Even today, there's still remnants from uh, the vicious fighting here. Here's a live uh, M1 round right here that uh, was found, and this is the nose off a 20 millimeter cannon, nose comb off of one. So there's still plenty of reminders here on the on the battle, on the battle. And uh, I'm sure there's plenty more of this laying around if you spent some time out here poking around. 75 years and uh, stuff still laying all over the place out here. This is uh, one of the <clears throat> amphibious tractors that was knocked out uh, on the day of the invasion. Made its way in off the beach and probably got hit by one of the uh, 75 millimeter rounds from the point. Uh, who knows how many Marines were killed in it, but it's set here for 75 years and, and you can see the uh, Australian hardwood tree that's growing up out of it. You can see the engine block, some of the runners, and even the locking pins back there are still uh, nice and shiny almost like the day it was uh, was built they must be titanium or something but it's a reminder of uh, the mayhem that uh, took place here and uh, uh, also a reminder of how nature eventually reclaims all this battle debris out here unless it's preserved This is a Japanese Air Administration building. And this housed all the officers and all the administrative personnel that ran all the complex activities on the airfield here. And uh, as you can see, it was uh, well built uh, with aesthetics in mind and also strength. And uh, it was also used as a, a fortification when the Marines started to take the airfield. The Japanese uh, sconned themselves in here and uh, the Marines had quite a firefight driving them out of here and you can see the tremendous amount of damage it took from pre-invasion shelling and, and bombing and uh, once we took the building we used it for uh, command post headquarters, uh, all sorts of different functions. If you go around and actually look at the Architectural features, you can tell the Japanese uh, built this with aesthetics in mind and it uh, also with longevity. You know, they planned on being here for, uh, you know, who knows, hundreds of years. Uh, so they invested a lot of resources in constructing not only this building, but the power station and buildings like this all over the Pacific. So it's a, it's a testament to the, you know, the Japanese vision for their uh, domination of the Pacific and uh, you know 75 years later it's still here and practically all the American structures that were built are long gone but the Japanese structures are here and they'll be here for a long time. This is an enormous uh, aircraft uh, graveyard. Uh, all sorts of aircraft here that were lost in operational accidents. Japanese planes that were bombed 
in the spring when Halsey came down through here and made air strikes. So just about every type of aircraft that operated in this theater, uh, you'll see wreckage out here and this enormous pile that goes on and on and on and it gives you an idea of uh, the amount of aircraft that uh, that ended up lost and in scrap heaps and accidents and so forth in the, the battles out here. Pretty astounding sight. Okay, our group is examining the wreckage of a A6M Japanese Zero that uh, was probably destroyed in the uh, spring air raids that uh, ravaged the airfield here. And this was probably shoved off over here uh, just to get it out of the way. So we're looking at the uh, wreck of a uh, American Corsair fighter plane. And you can see the engine block and the bent propeller there. Some of the wreckage here that's been gathered up into a uh, pile. Uh, here is one of the 50 caliber machine guns with a uh, 50 caliber round still in the firing chamber. Another tragic sight that uh, someone paid the, probably the ultimate price for. The Marine Corps unfortunately lost track of this young man just as he had slipped away from his unit. Somehow um, he was lost track of in the records. His commanding officer and other men he served with thought he had been evacuated. In fact, that probably was not the case. It was his own mother who had not heard from him in more than six months who began inquiring as to his whereabouts. And because of her looking out for her son, um, the Marine Corps realized that he was missing. And she did not find out then until a full year later, September of 1945, that he had been killed here on Peleliu. So I feel very, very honored and grateful that a 17 year old would come and, and do the kind of things that that he did and so many others did here on Peleliu. He died just a couple days before his 19th birthday. So he um, really made the ultimate sacrifice and I, I think it's really wonderful to be here amongst all of us today to remember what he and so many other young Americans were willing to sacrifice. Thank you very much. lots and lots of unexploded shells which the Navy Marine artillery units fired up in here and they're all over the place out in there but of course uh, during all the airstrikes the Japanese just climbed in the caves these have been gathered up they were all scattered all over the place here and of course their the noses have been taken off and they've been diffused so gives you some idea what the Japanese were using as uh, their uh, defensive weapons here Check out all the caves to your left as you go down through there. Some of them are blown, some of them are still open. This one has, interestingly enough, a lot of lighting fixtures in here, so it could be that they actually had a generator in here and lights. See all the different light. Amazingly enough, our sake bottle that hasn't been scoffed up by someone. These are kind of treasured by relic hunters. <laughs> Look at that. Traditional naval rice bowls. They had a lot of radio batteries in here, so there must have been some communication stuff in here. We're in one of the caves here in the Five Brothers area and we're looking at lots and lots of field radio batteries, communications equipment, uh, switchboards, electrical components, and 
you can see some of it that still exists here and over here is a, a huge battery that would have operated some sort of high powered um, communications equipment and this may well have been an area that Nakagawa would have operated from. This sign has just been put up recently and uh, it gives you an explanation uh, describing what you're about to enter here. This is what it looked like when the Marines uh, came through here and actually took the cave. You can see the barrels are filled with coral rubble to kind of protect the entrance there. And it's, you can also see that probably took some shell fire and uh, a lot of debris fell down in front of it. But what you're gonna witness is some excellent Japanese engineering. When you go in here, it's sort of mind boggling to see what they've done. They've tunneled it out into this elaborate cave complex here. And they call it the caisson cave because there are a lot of Japanese artillery caissons, the old sort of wagon wheel type that you see in the 30s, uh, you know, archival films. There's a lot of debris on the floor when you're in there, but, so be very careful when you're crawling around. You can uh, see some of the 75 millimeter uh, tank rounds from Sherman tanks that they fired through the uh, entrance here. It's really kind of a marvelous engineering feat to come out here and do this out in the middle of the Pacific here. So it shows you, you know, the Japanese uh, skill of civil engineering. I'm not exactly sure who did it, but it's quite a, a feat of engineering. So this is the famous Thousand Man Cave on Palalu. And when I first heard about this, I went, ah, there's no cave that can hold a thousand men. And then uh, when I got here and went inside and started exploring the labyrinth of tunnels and passages, I said, <clears throat> you could probably hold more than a thousand men. We're at this entrance here. They had entrances all down through here and also on the other side of the mountain. And this housed mostly naval personnel. And of course, these were impervious to any kind of shell fire. Just about everywhere the Japanese forces were stationed, they always made sure that uh, troops were supplied with copious quantities of sake and beer. And this is testament to that right here along this passage here. The naval personnel and the army personnel did not get along well. The Navy would not contribute any labor to the, what the Army was doing down in the Umabrogal. So there was a, a bad situation with cooperation between the two uh, forces. These little alcoves that are carved into the sides here would have served as probably officers' rooms. They probably would have had a curtain up over here, maybe a desk or a bed. And uh, so this would have been quarters or maybe uh, supply room of some sort. So you'll see a lot of these along the way in here. There were mining troops that brought down, were brought down especially from Japan to help construct this. And this was uh, not so much a fighting position. It was more of a troop quarters uh, to shelter them from any air attacks, pre-invasion bombardment and so forth. But it's a massive labyrinth of, of tunneling. Supposedly, from what I've been told, that was where the residue from amputations and so forth would be brushed off into right there and then they would clean it out. But this was the, uh, the hospital area here. And still some, still some medical bottles today that haven't been carried off by visitors. And you can see a Japanese prayer stick here for a lost relative. And this is one of the passages that's uh, either blown shut or collapsed with the passage of time. You see a Japanese flag right there, probably from some relative. So we'll, uh, this will be as far as we go. It's kind of a, the same thing on and on and on. Um, you guys all see the uh, sniper round right through this guy's head. Yeah. Sad story there. What kind of helmet is that? It's a GI helmet. Mm -hmm. 
whoever was wearing this is killed instantly and uh, so I'll take a moment of silence and just uh, you know as our tribute our own way say a prayer whatever you want to do just uh, you know when I hold this right here just the sweep of emotion that comes over me it's just uh, I mean, where we've been walking and what those guys went through let's just have a moment of silence right American Canteen, uh, full of water, vintage 1944. I'm sure it's got lots of nutrients in it. Maybe some rust. Man, people people would have paid a thousand dollars for a canteen of water on the first couple of days of the invasion here. So that would have been a valuable item. Got it. Uh, George Jr., you good? I'm good. Some rough terrain we're uh, climbing around in here. This is a propeller probably from a Japanese A6M0. Some of the aircraft debris from the aircraft that operated off of the satellite field over on Negdebus Island in uh, various places around the island you see scattered Japanese aircraft wreckage but it might have been in a maintenance shop being repaired or something while it's laying out here by itself. And you can see uh, 30 caliber machine guns these were probably out of the Japanese zeros and and also see 20 millimeter cannon here. So, uh, and you see a lot of acetylene tanks, oxygen tanks there. And believe it or not, there are lots of these weapons buried in the ground here still. This is the barrel of a either a machine gun or a cannon right there and there's one actually that's grown into the bottom of the tree trunk out here so uh, here's another cannon right here buried in the ground there's uh, one that was grown into the base of this tree remarkable uh, reminder of what time in nature can do you know how heavy that is <laughs> Not a rock. No. Trying to shrapnel problem from probably a battleship round. Saying what does this weigh? 20, 25 pounds? Yeah, it's easy. It's in that weight range. It's pretty heavy. Yeah. It doesn't look as heavy as this. Yeah. How'd you like to get hit with a piece of that? Flying at uh, <laughs> 20 miles an hour or something. You never know what this big is. So what you're seeing here is a Japanese fortified cave. They would fill these barrels up full of coil rubble. And sometimes they would stack them three, four barrels thick. So it would be impossible for an artillery shell to penetrate that. So the cave is in the back of this uh, formation of barrels here. And it made a pretty formidable defensive area. So what we're looking at here is an LVTA called the Lady Luck and it had a 75 millimeter short barreled cannon on it and what it was doing here was challenging a Japanese coastal defense gun 120 millimeter and it actually ran up onto the Japanese gun pit, crushed the gun pit uh, structure in, damaged the gun. Uh, the, the Japanese crew was wiped out. This is really an interesting sight because it's kind of a representative of the standoff between Japanese defensive weapons and our LVTs and how they were used for tanks. Yeah, look 
that metal. <laughs> Some uh, examples of what the Japanese artillery could do to these amphibs and uh, probably the crew here were obviously probably killed so kind of a tragic sight there but reminder of how thin skinned these things were. We're really uh, on an island where hell occurred, and um, I feel a real sense of uh, almost overwhelming gratitude and humbleness and uh, thankfulness, and especially a salute to all those guys that went through all that hell here. I've been here with a lot of them and heard their stories, and you know they echo in my mind all the time. Really, you know they come back and different parts of my life and, and I'll remember what one guy said about this and that and it makes you really realize what's important in life what's really important you know those guys are out here some of them been been farm boys in Kansas only a month before had never imagined the South Pacific knew nothing about it and all of a sudden they were here in the middle of hell and uh, you can just imagine what it was like for them Thank you.